Bye. 
holy and great. You love us. We can't imagine the Lord. We seek to just be in your presence and we know you're there all the time. We just thank you for that and your love for us. Amen.
Father, we just pray that you help us do exactly that. When we seek you, desire to seek you first above all things. And I pray that we all pray and seek your will before we make decisions. And uh, just we seek your love and guidance in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys may greet one another. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Heartland. Uh, this morning, uh, I want to read this letter. We had our Harvest Festival uh, Saturday week, a week ago, and someone messaged us, and this is what they said. I want to thank you all for a wonderful day. My kids were actually heading to Lane Orchard all the way from Jones County for what I thought was a free event. I was so embarrassed when I realized it was not free and had to usher my kids back in the car. And I remembered your festival we'd accidentally pulled into earlier. We came back, and I'm so glad we did. The place was beautiful, the people were wonderful, and we had a great time. Yes. Plus, we got cake. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, it was delicious. <laughs> I would not be at all surprised if you don't see us again. The joy of the Lord is alive and well in your church family. Thank you all. And such a blessing. For you all, everybody that, that contributed candy and cakes and time and effort, setting up, tearing down, uh, working the booth, everybody played a part in, in the Harvest Festival. I'm so glad that you did. So thankful that you did. Um, in the way of announcements, because this is the fifth Tuesday, there's no men's or ladies Bible study this week. So except for Men of the Word on Tuesday morning at 6.30 a.m. at Chick-fil-A on Watson and Warner Robins uh, with Greg Cannington. Also, the Word on Wednesday with Pastor Phil, who's out of town, so I'll be filling in. (laughs) That was pretty rough. (laughs) But we'll be in the book of Joshua as as Israel, the nation of Israel, now going into the land that God promised. And speaking of Israel, as we talked last week, what can we do for Israel? Talking about what's going on now. So what the events we're studying on Wednesday night are when Israel took possession of God's land that he promised them way before 1948. Uh, so also the Misfits meet every Friday evening at 6 p.m. And in the way of Operation Christmas Child, there's still some boxes out there, and Collection Day will be November the 19th. It's a Sunday, the last Sunday that we can do that as well. Um, we'll have a time where we can come together. Usually the youth does that to put the extra boxes together. But if you have a box, you don't have to specifically use these boxes, but you can. So there's some out in the foyer uh, that you can take and use. Uh, lastly, if you need a Bible... Because today, that's what we're looking at. Every Sunday, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, the Word of God. Except last Sunday, we didn't go chapter by chapter and verse by verse. But it was important, because we need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. If you need a Bible, if you'll raise your hand, Matt is in the back, and he'll put one in there. And if you already have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 24. And we'll stand up in a minute and read that. But remember, a couple of weeks ago, we were in Acts chapter 23. And if you remember the story, Paul, he came to Jerusalem bringing offerings. He wanted to be there by the festival. And when he got there, the, the leader, James, the leader of the church, Jesus' half-brother, said, you know what would be a good idea? All the Jews think that you're telling everybody to abstain from doing the things that our heritage is, so being a Jew. And Paul was not teaching that at all. He said, well, if you'll do this vow of purification with these four men, then everybody will see that you still observe the traditions of our father. And as he did that, a riot broke out as some people identified him and accused him falsely. Uh, And we know because of that, Paul was able to do the one thing, one of the things that he wanted to do his entire life life after he became a believer. And that that is to tell his Jewish brothers the truth that Jesus was their Messiah. He was the Christ. And as he did that, remember he mentioned the word Gentile, 
And the riot broke out again. And so then the commander, Lysias, he took him down before the Sanhedrin council. And Paul was thinking, wow, I got another chance. I'm going to tell these guys, because they're just like I am. They hate Jesus' followers. And he gave them, he was going to give them the gospel, but he saw how hardened their hearts were. And perhaps he was feeling down or discouraged because maybe he said he thought, maybe he thought he said something incorrectly. Maybe he thought he failed in bringing these people to Christ. But Jesus told him, spoke to him directly in his jail cell and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. And that sentence tells Paul, as Pastor Phil pointed out, you've been faithful to do what I've asked you to do, Paul. The rest is up to me. You cannot bring someone to Christ. And that's true for each of us. We can't bring someone to Christ. We can tell them the gospel. We can tell them who Jesus is, that he died on the cross for his sins, and they rose again the third day because of his great love for us. But it's up to the person between them and God to make that individual decision that I'm going to accept Christ as my personal Savior. You know, in our hearts, our emotions, they often yearn. They get caught up in that, don't they? Especially when we're talking about family or close friends, that we want them to have what we have in Christ. But we can't make them make that decision. They have to make it on their own. And then by the end of the chapter, remember Claudius Lysias, the commander, he writes a letter to Felix, and he gave his account of events, how he valiantly jumped in and rescued Paul, who, who was a Roman citizen, from this violent, angry mob. It's not quite the truth, but later Lysias, he also learned of these 40 men, 40 plus men that had made a vow. They wanted to take Paul's life. And in their vow, they said they would not eat until they had accomplished their goal. And the commander, he still really had no idea why these guys wanted to kill Paul. And then at the end of the chapter, Paul, he's a prisoner in Herod's Praetorium in Caesarea, which is the seat of the capital of Judea at the time, awaiting his trial before Felix. And as a side note, it, two weeks ago, Phil, he did fill in for me as well, and Aaron does as well. And I'm so thankful I have other pastors. A church of our size normally don't have that luxury, but I'm so thankful we have other men who can teach the Word of God uh, when I'm not here. So, if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to Acts chapter 24, we're not going to read the whole chapter, but we're going to begin in verse 10. We need to bring some coffee in here. <laughs> Begin at verse 10, it says, Then Paul, after the governor had nodded to him to speak, answered, Inasmuch as I know that you have been for many years a judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself, because you may ascertain that it is no more than twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. And they found me in the temple... They neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone, nor inciting the crowd, either in the synagogues or in the city. Nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me, but I confess to you that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept that there, may be, there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense towards God and men. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation, in the midst of which some Jews from Asia found me, purified in the temple, neither with a mob nor with tumult. They ought to have been here before they, before you to object if they had anything against me or else. 
Let those who were here themselves say if they have found any wrongdoing in me while I stood before the council, unless it is for this one stated statement I, which I cried out standing among them concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by you this day. But when Felix heard these things, having a more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceedings and said, When Lucius the commander comes down, I will make a decision on your case. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide for or to visit him. And after some days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was, a, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now, as he reasoned about righteous self-control and judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today, and Lord, we thank you for your word. I just pray, Lord, that uh, you would open our hearts, our ears, and our minds to hear what you, and through the Spirit, have to say to us. God, I pray that everyone here knows you as their Lord and Savior, but if not, I pray the day would be the day of their salvation. Lord, and those who are struggling, Lord, or have difficulties and trials, physical trials, spiritual trials, God, I pray for them today. Lord, that you would uplift them. Lord, that you would encourage them and strengthen them. And give them peace. And Lord, we do pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for America as a nation that we continue to stand with them. And Lord, we'll give you all the glory for the great things that you are going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So in verse 1 it says... Now after five days, Ananias the high priest came down with the elders and a certain orator named Tertullus. These gave evidence to the governor against Paul. And when he was called upon, Tertullus began his accusation saying, Seeing that through you we enjoy great peace and prosperity is being brought to this nation by your foresight. We accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix with all thankfulness. So this chapter, it unfolds. Uh, we have Ananias and all the elders of Jerusalem. They are here in the Sanhedrin. They make this 70-mile journey to Caesarea. And they did it in a rather quick manner. Remember, they had to travel by foot or by horse or by mule. You see, they didn't know that the Roman soldiers had taken Paul out by night. But when they found out, they made their way to Caesarea. And the Jews bring with them a certain, that word certain, continues to appear in Acts, a certain or specific orator or a lawyer, Tertullus. And his name is Greek, so he's a Hellenistic a Jew. And he makes the formal accusations against Paul. He was their ace lawyer. He was someone who could provide a slam dunk in this case against Paul. And remember, this is a very angry group of men. But what is oddly absent from them, as Paul pointed out in the passage we read, is that those people who made the first accusation, the Jews from Asia, they're not here. And none of the 40 men who tried to take his life made this oath to kill Paul were there. And my mind thinks, I wonder if they've eaten yet. Do I think about eating? <laughs> the way my mind is wired. But Paul's fate is now squarely in the hands of, of these Jewish leaders and this Roman Felix that we hear about. And these guys, they don't want to spoil what could be their very last chance of sending Paul away or having him executed. Remember, they failed in the temple. They started beating him while he was in the temple with their fists. And they were trying to take his life when Lysias did come down and, and take Paul away. And then they failed in their trials uh, with the commander. And the 40 assassins failed. Now they're in this Roman court, which could be their last court. And Tertullus, Tertullus he begins with this syrupy, sugary, buttery flattery of Felix. Felix was an evil man. 
Felix was the one who succeeded Pontius Pilate. And he says this, seeing that through you we enjoy great peace and prosperity is being brought to this nation by your foresight. We accept it always in all places, most noble Felix with all thankfulness. They hated Felix's guts. <laughs> they didn't like Pontius Pilate, but remember when they wanted to have Jesus crucified, they leaned on Pilate. Remember that? So this picture is drawn for us by this first century uh, Roman historian named Tacitus. He said that Felix was a governor, and he was a successor, as I said, of Pontius Pilate. He was a freedman, which means he was a former slave, which became free, and he was a cruel man, wielding the power of a king with the mind of a slave. Felix's public and private life is not a pretty one. He traded influences of his infamous brother in order to get where he was, out of slavery into this leadership position. And he indulged in every license with excess, thinking that he could do no evil with impunity. That means he had no repercussions. He could do anything he wanted, any time he wanted, with anyone he wanted, and nobody was going to make accusation or take him down or blame him for what he was doing. He's a very evil man. Yet these Jews, through Tortullus, they just prop him up and say how wonderful he is. Again, the Jews, they, were, they reviled the Roman government. Tertullus was a smooth operator, though. you got to give him that. And he was an avid liar. The Jews hated Rome. They hated Felix. Felix was evil. So let's pick back up in verse 4. Nevertheless, not to be tedious to you any further, I beg you to hear by your courtesy a few words from us. For we have found this man a plague, a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world, a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, and we seized him and wanted to judge him according to our law. But the commander, Lysias, came in, in by great violence and took him out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come to you by examining him yourself. You may ascertain all these things of which we accuse him. And the Jews also ascended, maintaining that these things were so. You see, Tertullus, he labeled Paul a plague. And what does a plague do? It spread like wildfire, right? And it goes everywhere, very intensely, without regards to people or person. They were claiming that Paul was creating dissension everywhere in the Roman Empire. We also notice that he uses this term, a sect of the Nazarenes. And the Nazarenes, this is the only time Christians are referred to as Nazarenes, is this passage right here, which is a slur against Christians. Because Nazareth was not a highly thought of place. It wasn't highly regarded, even in Jesus' day. Remember when Philip, Philip found Nathaniel and said to him in John chapter 1, We have found him of whom the Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? It wasn't a highly regarded place. And so Tertullus he makes that connection and points it at Paul. Tertullus, he makes that accusation. Paul is accused of sedition, creating a riot, a rebellion throughout the entire Roman Empire against the Roman rule. You see, Tertullus, he's trying to paint Paul as a leader of Jewish zealots, a sect that intends to rise up against Rome. Possibly Tertullus, he dreamed up these things because he heard Lysias. Remember, Lysias initially thought that's who Paul was, a leader of a rebellion that had escaped back in Acts chapter 21. This accusation is totally untrue, though. We know that. Paul is then accused of profaning the temple, which is also untrue. And if you remember through our studies in the Gospels and, and recently, the temple was the one area 
that the Romans allowed the Jewish people to rule. And they could also exercise capital punishment. If a Gentile were to cross into the temple, it would mean their death. So this lawyer is trying to make the point that Paul had defamed the temple, defiled the temple, and in doing so, that's part of their responsibility to do what they want. And then this lawyer, this great lawyer, the smooth talker, he takes a jab at the commander Lysias, claiming that the Jews, they were well on their way to settling this dispute, to resolving this situation. They had it under control. And then the commander, he came down with great violence. And now he commanded the, the commander to bring it before Felix. See, we would have settled it, Felix. It wouldn't have even come before you. We would have resolved it in a timely fashion. Yet we're here because of Lysias. It's his fault. We had it under control. And then all the attending Jews agreed. You see, Tertullus, he was hoping to build his case that Paul was an insurrectionist. That he was wreaking havoc against all of Rome that he was raising up rebellion from this sect of the Nazarenes. And we know from history that Rome, it loved peace. Rome would use great violence in order to keep peace. That's how much they loved peace. These men were supposed to be the leaders, these men that were presenting the case. Remember, they were supposed to be the religious leaders of Israel. The heads that are supposed to be the teachers of the word of God, the keepers of God's word. Yet here they are lying again in order to maintain their power and their position, just as they did with Jesus. But think about this one step further. These are the very same men that Paul wanted to hear the gospel and to understand that Jesus loved them and died for them. And he rose again the third day so that they could have a personal relationship with him. These men who were trying to end Paul, he cared about them. So we continue on in verse 10. It says, Then Paul, after the governor, had nodded him to speak, answered, Inasmuch as I know that you have been for many years the judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. Because you may ascertain that it is no more than twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone or inciting the crowd, either in the synagogues or in the city. Nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. By this I confess to you, that according to the way which you call, which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing in all things which are written in the law and the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense towards God and men. So Paul begins his defense. And he began by acknowledging that, hey, Felix, I know you've been around. You've been a judge for many years. You're familiar with how these things are. And he knows that Felix is even familiar with the way. And he presents this timeline, this undisputable, with the facts. I was only in Jerusalem for 12 days to worship. They know this. I wasn't in the temple creating a riot or inciting some type of disturbance. I wasn't acting unlawfully. I was acting under the law, peacefully, in the temple. I was there to worship. Nor did I do any of the things which they accused me of in the synagogues in and around. There were many synagogues in Jerusalem. He says, I didn't do any of these things they're saying in the synagogues either. I was in Jerusalem for one purpose, to worship God. Well, maybe for two, he had brought an offering. And then he said in verse 13, as for their accusations, they can't prove any of them. Not one thing they accused Paul of did they have evidence to bring forth. Or they didn't have a witness. 
And then in verse 14, he says, according to the way, that is, the relationship, that's what they called Christianity in that day, the way, and it's really a good way uh, of thinking of Christianity. The word Christian doesn't mean as much as it used to, does it? It's watered down. But the way is that you've chosen to live your life in the way that Jesus described. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So there's only one way. And this is the way that Paul is talking about. And then Paul says, I worship the Messiah through the God of our fathers and all things written in the law and the prophets. This is a great way that Paul says, I believe in the entire scriptures. I didn't just pick and choose. You see, because the Jews of that day only looked for what? In the Messiah. The conquering king to come back. They weren't looking for the suffering savior who died on the cross for their sin and rebellion and rose again the third day. They didn't, they weren't paying attention to that part of scripture. They only wanted the part that was convenient, the part they liked, the part that they wanted to present and to listen to. But Paul is saying, I believe all of the scriptures. Remember the Sadducees also, he pointed out about the resurrection. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. They don't believe in miracles. And they only studied the first five books of the Bible called the Pentateuch. But they still only looked for this coming king who would conquer the world and set up his kingdom. Paul states, I have hope in God, which they also accept. In fact, he said, I have hope in the resurrection. Because I do, I try to live with a clear conscience before God and among men by presenting the gospel truth regarding Jesus, the Messiah. Even to these men who are now accusing me. And then he continues in verse 17. Now after many years, I, I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation in the midst of which some of the Jews of Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with a mob nor with tumult. They ought to have been here before you to object if they had anything against me, or else let those who are here themselves say if they found any wrongdoing in me while I stood before the council. Unless it is for this one statement which I cried out standing among them concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by you this day. You see, Tertullus, his plea, his accusation was totally to try to get the emotions of Felix on his side. He had no proof. But Paul is presenting the facts. He's presenting the facts of what actually happened and things that actually took place. Paul states that he even brought an offering for Israel, or at least for the church in Israel. And then the Jews of Asia, they found him, they spotted him, and they never liked Paul anyway. And they tried to beat him up, tried to, tried to kill him. Paul points out that those who made the accusation, well, they're not even standing before you. And you know, in their time, you had to have witnesses in order to accuse someone. But they had no one. Paul was very wise in Roman law. Because in order for a Roman citizen to be accused, he knew that there needed to be people there who were eyewitnesses that could make the accusation or confirm the accusation and produce evidence. Neither of these things happened. But then we continue in verse 22. But when Felix heard these things, having a more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceeding saying, when Lysias the commander comes down, I will make a decision on your case. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide for or visit him. You see, Felix, he knew both sides of this argument. He knew about the way. Luke makes a point of telling us that. He at least had an understanding of what being a Christian meant. Perhaps someone had shared with him at least enough of the gospel that he kind of comprehended what that was about. But more than that, he probably knew Christians. He knew how they lived. 
how they were peaceful people. And he knew Paul was not like that. He probably knew from some of the stories of his predecessor, Pilate, you know, how they crucified Jesus. Maybe they, he knew of how hundreds of people saw Jesus resurrected after they buried him in the tomb. Maybe he knew that. There's also a story, and I don't, I don't know that it's a factual story, maybe it is, but history, historians would tell us that there was a magician who helped him woo his wife, Drusilla, away from her previous husband. And they would say that possibly it was Simon the Sorcerer from back in Acts chapter 8. Remember, he was the one that wanted to buy the Holy Spirit power from Peter, right? As if you could do that. So Felix, he passes the buck. He kicks the can down the, down the road because he says he's waiting on Lysias, but remember, Lysias had already sent a letter explaining how he rescued Paul valiantly from this mob, these Jewish men. <clears throat> Evidently, Felix also, he knew or had some confidence that Paul was not a violent criminal. He was not an insurrectionist because he gives him complete liberty to meet with his friend and for his friends to provide for him. He didn't see Paul as a violent threat that Tertullus and the Jews presented him as. So in verse 24, as we continue, it says, After some days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Felix, he brought his wife to hear Paul. Drusilla was Jewish, and she was the youngest daughter of Herod Agrippa. It has been said that she is very beautiful. And we all know how twisted the family of the Herods was from our previous studies through the gospel. Herod the Great was her grandfather. Remember, he was the one who ordered the slaughter of all the male children in Bethlehem, trying to get rid of the one who was proclaimed to be the king, trying to get rid of Jesus. Satan always has a way to try to step into God's plan. Chuck Smith says this, Herod Agrippa I was the Herod that had, that had beheaded James, the brother of John, and had Peter in prison intending to do the same thing to him. But the Lord delivered Peter out of jail by night. And then Herod Agrippa I, he went down to Caesarea where he made this great speech, a great oration. And the men of Tyre began to cry, It's the voice of God and not of a man. And then the angel of the Lord smote him, and he was eaten with worms. That's Herod Agrippa I, and Drusilla was his daughter. You see, Drusilla had been married to King Azasus, but through the help of a magician, Felix had enticed her away from her husband, and now she had become the wife of this slave made governor. And this was his third wife. Verse 25, Paul presents the gospel, and this is the focus of our word today. He presents the gospel in this manner. He reasoned with Felix about righteousness, about self-control, and about the judgment to come. Remember what we said about Felix. He was a former slave. He thought he could do anything he wanted to and get away with it. As far as righteousness, I'm sure that Paul told him our righteousness, Felix, in those filthy rags. That there is no, none righteous among us. Not one of us is righteous. And we are only made right by the blood of the Lamb. I'm sure he said something similar to Romans 5, 1 and 2, where it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, or made right by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have access by faith into this grace which we stand, and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. You see, 
We don't have any righteousness of our own. And I'm sure he made that clear to Felix. Felix, you're not ever going to ever be righteous on your own. And then he talked to him about self-control. Now see, you know, Paul's trying to get out of prison, right? And so he's standing before the one man that could do that or put him in prison. And he's saying, Felix, you need to know about righteousness. And then he tells Felix, hey, you need to know about self-control. Because he didn't have any. Paul, knowing the wicked, self-indulgent lifestyle that that not only Felix, but his wife, Drusilla, lived, he moves on to tell them about self-control. Knowing that self-control is a fruit of a spirit-filled life. Maybe he said something like we're told in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, where it says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, self-control, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope of the glorious, glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for us his own special people, zealous for good work. You see, Paul, he told him about righteousness and that we had to get that through Jesus Christ, but he told him about self-control, that that's how we live for Christ, through self-control. And we have that as a fruit of the Spirit. But then lastly, he told Felix, this wicked man, about the judgment to come. He said, Felix, you know, One day you're going to have to answer for your life. You're going to stand before God. Romans 5, verses 10 and 11, I'm sure he said something like this. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. We persuade men, but we are well known to God. And I trust are well known in your consciences. He said, Felix, look, we're going to all face the judgment. And then John 5, 24, he probably told him something like this. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word, this is Jesus talking, and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but has passed from death into life. You see, there's only one way we can escape condemnation judgment from God, and that is to put on the righteousness of Christ. You see, he's telling Felix that we're all going to stand before Christ one day, and we're either going to stand in the righteousness that Christ has supplied for us and freely given us that all we have to do is accept, or we're going to stand and judgment for our own righteousness, which is as filthy rags, which is bathed in our sin. And we're going to stand before a righteous God who knows the difference. We won't be able to talk our way out of it, and he will execute perfect judgment. And the one who stands before God in their own righteousness, they are going to spend eternity in hell. Eternity is a very long time. It's not something we want to do. It's not just over with when we die. We're going to be one of two places. We're going to be eternally with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior in heaven, or we're going to be eternally in hell. Now, regarding the hearing of the gospel presented by Paul, when Paul reaches this part about the judgment, we're told that Felix becomes afraid. And then he puts off making a decision. You see, he's under heavy conviction, I feel like. And he just sends Paul away. It's like he can't make a decision. Leave me alone, Paul. I'll get back with you. We're presented this picture of a spiritual struggle that Felix was having within him. Fear that maybe choosing Christ would mean losing what his flesh desired. All the perks he had of being a ruler there. In Judea. 
Maybe he was fearing that one day the judgment was coming, or maybe he knew it was just around the corner. But he wanted to continue in his wickedness, his lifestyle, just a little while longer. A choice should have been made by Felix. It has been said over the years that atheism has slain its thousands, but procrastination has slain its ten thousands. It seemed that Felix was hearing God's call, and his chest was pounding. He knew he needed to do something, but instead he chose to put it off just one more day. Felix was looking for a more convenient time to accept Jesus or to hear about the gifts of God through faith in Christ. Maybe Felix was like this. Maybe you've heard someone say, hey, I just want to clean up my act. I want to get my life together before I start serving the Lord, before I start going to church. You know, ever known anybody that thought that way? Go away for now. When I have a more convenient time, I will call you. And here's a big hint. There will never be a convenient time. It won't happen. So let's continue in verse 26. It says, Meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given to him by Paul that he might release him. Therefore, he sent he sent for him more often and conversed with him. See, Luke then reveals to us what Felix's heart really was. His heart was choked out by the weeds. Remember the parable of the soils in Matthew 13? The seed was planted. Paul planted the seed. But the weeds of Felix's life, they rose up and they choked out that seed so that it could not germinate. It choked out the truth of the word of God. And Felix puts off this decision of his flesh, hoping that Paul is going to give him some money. And then he would release Paul. Felix was only concerned about the money. And he began to focus on the money and not on the truth of the word of God. And he continued to have conversations with Paul. He sent for him more and more, but I have a feeling he was only just listening trying to placate Paul so that Paul would give him some money so that he could be released. But Paul, he didn't have any money. And then verse 27, it says, But after two years, Porcius Festus succeeded Felix, and Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. Can you imagine, take a brief moment from Felix, but let's think about Paul. Can you imagine what Paul might be thinking? He's left two years in prison, even though it wasn't an intense prison, he had freedom. Maybe he's thinking in his mind, okay, Jesus, you said I would go to Rome, and I'm still stuck in Caesarea. What's going on? What's taking so long? But I want you to think about this. Maybe Paul, maybe Paul needed a rest. Maybe this was God's way of slowing Paul down. Remember, we studied this whole book of Acts. And Paul, he worked day and night. He worked at night making tents to provide for his own well-being so that nobody had to give him money. He worked during the day teaching the Word of God, presenting the Gospel to people. And he was independent. Maybe he needed a vacation. Maybe he needed a sabbatical. Maybe he needed just time where he didn't bear the full responsibility of planting churches and raising up leadership and spreading the gospel, God slowed Paul down by using unorthodox circumstances. So sometimes, I just want to point that sometimes we find ourselves in those unorthodox circumstances, don't we? Maybe a physical reason, maybe something else is going on. God will slow us down when we need it. No doubt, though, Paul continued to teach and evangelize and disciple those around him. And Paul remained under house arrest for more than two years because Felix is playing both sides of this issue. He wants Paul to give him money, but he wants to do a favor for the Jews so that he'll be in their favor. Porcus Festus is the next Roman procurator of Judea. He 
succeeds Felix at about 55 or 60 AD, and history would describe him as, as more fair and more reasonable. And we'll talk about that more next week in Acts chapter 5. But for a moment, again, let's look at the procrastination of Felix. And let's think about this. He was presented the gospel. And surely Paul told him that we all are sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God and that we need a Savior. And that while we were still in our sin, while we were still sinners, while we're still actively living in the sin that Christ died for, he died for us. I'm sure he told Felix that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that there is no condemnation for those who are under or who have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Paul probably told Felix something similar to, I was reading a book by Pastor Sandy Adams, he probably told him something like this, As Christ lives in us, we swap all that we are for all that he is. My guilt for his grace, my pride for his plan, my hurts for his healing, my pain for his peace, my fears for his fortitude. Felix could have made a life-changing decision, eternal decision, but he chose instead to put it off for a more convenient time. Have you put off this most important decision in your life for a more convenient time? Maybe you know that God put something on your heart. Maybe you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, but God put something on your heart that's to action, something to do, but you kind of keep putting it off hoping that your finances will improve or your work situation will improve. But it's not going to happen. There would never be a more convenient time to serve the Lord than right now, today, when God speaks to your heart and that still small voice in your chest starts pounding. It's the time to make a decision. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you never made that decision Remember, atheism, or not believing in God, has slain its thousands, but procrastination it has slain its tens of thousands. And again, I want to repeat the verse of John 5.24. Most assuredly, I say to you, that he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. So simple. And shall not come into judgment, but be passed from death, that is the judgment into life, eternal life. Putting off God when he's calling, when they feel that pulling, when you feel that stirring, when God's speaking to you to do something, when we put, off, put that off, it can be catastrophic in our life. And if we don't know him as our Lord and Savior, it can be deadly. It could be eternal separation from the God that loves us. That spiritual death, the great white throne judgment, it's described in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, where at the end of the millennial reign of Christ, men will be judged for their relationship with him. And we'll either stand there with, our, with the righteousness of Christ and claim that, or we'll stand there in our own righteousness. And if we stand there in our own righteousness, we'll be cast into the lake of fire which does not go out. Please take action before it's too late. And if you are a believer in Christ and God's calling you to step out to do something, he's put something on your heart, today would be a great day to do that. So I'm going to close in prayer, and next week we'll begin chapter 25 as we're closing out this wonderful book of Acts as we see the church and its foundations. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. Lord, by human nature, we are procrastinators, many of us. And Lord, we often put things off that you uh, speak to our hearts. Lord, but I pray in this area of knowing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that if there's anyone here who is in that situation where they know God is calling them, they feel that tug, Lord, I pray that they will speak up and let us uh, pray with them 
If there's anyone here that's like this while everybody's got their eyes closed, just raise your hand. Well, let's, uh, let's pray. Lord, I pray for this one who raised his hand, Lord, that you would help them not to consider those around them or what people might would think or even how that would change his life, Lord, but he would take a step of faith for you to accept you as his Lord and Savior. And Lord, we give you all the glory, God, because you are the one who has called us. Lord, you are the one who died on the cross for our sin. Lord, you paid the way. All we have to do is accept it and walk in it. Lord, I also pray for those who maybe uh, have you given them something to do in their life, a step of faith, Lord, something more than what they would normally do, something extra, something hard and difficult, or, or maybe not, but God... For some reason, they have chosen not to do it at this time. God, I pray that you would give us, Lord, the wisdom and the courage when you call us to step out by faith, Lord, that our faith may grow and that your spirit may work within us. And Father, I just pray for our entire congregation. I thank you for them. We are so blessed. Lord, I pray for each and every one of us, Lord, as we go out, Lord, that you'd encourage us. Give us that boldness proclaim your word. And then we're going to give you all the praise and all the glory for what you could do in our lives, for what you have done, and what you are yet to do. And Lord, we do this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. You guys will stand and Praise the Lord one more time. You don't answer all my questions, but you hear me when I speak. You don't keep my heart from breaking, but when it does, you weep with me. You're so close that I can feel you when I've lost the words to pray. Though my eyes have never seen you.
Last week.